Thank you very thank much. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, and thank you, um, Dr. Honan, for all your sterling hard work and your availability and your support. With Thanks, Brother. Different pieces of legislation that we've tried to bring forward here, both you, Chair, and ourselves and the Rural Independents. And um, I really, really, on my own behalf, and, and my colleagues and the Irish people, I want to thank you from the bottom of our hearts because you're the only uh, drink of light that's in there in the system. Well, actually, actually, that's not right. Uh, there are, um, th there is a new understanding on the High Court bench, and I don't want to misrepresent my colleagues here. Good. Uh, they are, they are actually. Once it gets to the High Court, if you can get past the Circuit Court, they are say taking their responsibility seriously. Unfortunately, some have come in with, if you like, pre predetermined views on the notion that the money was borrowed and therefore must be paid back, and uh, there's, they can see no, no justice in denying the right to possession. And that's why it's important to have the EU directive implemented in full. Well, on that, um, I have written a parliamentary question to Minister of Finance, and the answer was vague a couple of weeks ago now, but he has, he's going to sign the directive. But as I said, the answer is vague, so you make for yourself uh, what you think of that. But look, I've listened to you but on, on, on Zoom when I was outside and I was at another meeting, but how would you um, view the current position of the Irish courts when assessing um, or making decisions on a case involving a bank, vulture fund and a, a, a debtor, uh, some in mortgage areas, and, you know, uh, is it fair or the system at the moment, or how, uh, is, is the system totally screwed in favour of the, the vulture funds or the, or the, or the banks? Uh, uh, no, it's not, but the procedure is skewed. So the actual end outcome is the result of a decision by a judge, but how you get there is, uh, is troublesome from my point of view because you have a situation where at the commencement of the problem, after the banking crash, uh, I used to handle all the mortgage cases uh, from up and down. The People used to travel up from Roscommon and Limerick and all sorts of places. And I, I, I protested to the Minister for Justice at the time Mr. Shatter, and uh, they, they legislated then to, 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 um, to give jurisdiction to the circuit courts. So the circuit courts now have the jurisdiction to deal with the family homes. They are the, uh, the subject of home loans uh, legislation. And the circuit courts are under pressure, and uh, they, they have a tendency to um, um, operate on, on a kind of factory, factory line basis. And an example of that is where uh, where the, the question of um, assessment uh, on, uh, called, they call it own motion assessment of compliance with EU law arises. Now, Irish courts say, what's that? They say, we operate an adversarial system here. You have to ask for something before you, you get it. There has to be a, a dispute uh, on paper first. But European courts don't operate an adversarial system. So the judge in a European court will take his jacket off and say, I must look at this, even though nobody has asked me. I must look to see whether or not the contract is fair. So there was huge uh, resistance to the idea that the, that the courts should have to uh, themselves look at the own motion, uh, <clears throat> by way of own motion, at the, at the fairness of the terms. And, and that's, that's, if you like, if you like, that's an institutional uh, resistance or pushback then you've got a situation where if you lose in the circuit court, you go to the high court and you think, right, I've got to get a hearing here. The high court then will say, you can't introduce new f grounds of appeal here. You didn't mention these in the circuit court. Uh, and uh, it's only, you're, you've, you've left it too late, in effect. And then you say, well, I'll go to the court of appeal. And the court of appeal says, no, no, your the high court application, the high court hearing was your last shot. I don't think that was ever the intention of uh, the, the Oireachtas. And I think, in fact, you'll note that all of the significant changes, sort of significant decisions that have, have uh, produced, if you like, new, new thinking on this, have come from the Supreme Court. And uh, now we're faced with a situation that very, very few cases will get to the Supreme Court. Um, and and I, I did have a proposal to make, I suppose I could make it now, and that is that the Supreme Court operates on the basis, as you know, that it will only hear cases which are of, if you like, public importance of a constitutional nature or otherwise, significant public importance. <clears throat> and uh, that being so, that's a test they have to pass before they're, they're put into the, what do they call it in America, the docket of the Supreme Court. 
And so they say, oh, we'll accept that case and we'll hear that because it's a matter of public importance. Straight away, that decision should entitle the litigants, if necessary, to legal aid. Because the same test applies to legal aid. Is the case that you want legal aid for a matter of public importance? So automatically, there should be legal aid available to anybody who wants to appeal to the Supreme Court. Now, that's just a suggestion. It might enable the Supreme Court. And I mentioned in the, I mentioned in the, um, in the letter, the eight-page letter that I wrote, that there are a couple of Supreme Court hints, if I could put it that way, that they, they want cases to come on particular points, in particular in relation to some of the matters that we've been talking about here. They want to hear these cases, but they can't. They, they have to come in. And uh, the only way you're going to get, encourage uh, a full uh, interrogation of, of what's going on in this system is to give legal aid to people who want to bring an action in the Supreme, and bring an appeal to the Supreme Court. It's cumbersome, but it's, it's effective. And you might say, it's in compliance with EU law. Interesting. Thank you for that. And how, and how will you, I know you probably answered this, but how can judges in, in court, you know, be making decisions when they do not have access or sight of the, of the mortgage documents? I mean, this is a basic, you think, uh, request, and surely the deed, they should be mortgage. I mean, your letter that you sent and I sent around was based mainly on this. Like, how is it acceptable? Why, why, how can well, they get away with it? The nature of evidence is, is a matter for the, for the courts. And say, what evidence will we accept as probative of a fact? And uh, there you go. The Oireachtas did pass the um, uh, Miscellaneous Provisions Act in 2020 during the COVID, the COVID Act, which in, allowed for hearsay evidence. This was a, a measure which uh, was pressed for by the, the banking community. They say, we, we, we can't proceed with our cases. And they said, because of COVID. But actually, what they meant was, because we can't get the documents. So. The, the courts are now empowered to say, okay, we'll hear hearsay evidence about the, uh, ne the, about the, the mortgage as a fact without necessarily having to see the facts, uh, the, the documents. That, that's where you're at. In other words, is the evidence before the court probative of the existence of a mortgage? And if so, then there's probably no need to see the mortgage deed. Because somebody has sworn that there was a mortgage. So that, that's okay, that's evidence now. So that's, that's the other evidence that they accept is, oh, I am the owner as registered on the, on the register of titles. They say, well, that's the register. That must be evidence as well. So it is possible to, um, to progress cases of this sort on paperwork basis only. And you can imagine the difficulty from a lay litigant's point of view where he's handed a bundle of papers and said, there, that those are our proofs. And he said, you know, do the best you can with that. And he's, on the day in court, he's, he protests about price he protests about uh, the circumstances when he engaged in the mortgage in the first place and about uh, uh, difficulties in getting a solicitor and all sorts of stuff like that. But he's not really equipped to actually um, uh, plumb the depths of the paperwork that's being handed. Nor is the judge who says, I've got a bundle of papers here. Do you expect me to read this? And he looks to the defendant and says, do you expect me to read this? And the defendant says, well, my point is such and such. And of course, he doesn't know what he's saying, really. The judge says, well, the paperwork is here. There's an affidavit which confirms everything, and we'll proceed. And, and is it, in your view, a part of the culture down across the river that lay litigants are frowned on, that they're not really, um, they're really a, an unwanted species in well, the course, all, all, in the courts, all courts would operate much more smoothly if there were no litigants there. <laughs> uh, but that is the way courts are, are proceeding now to develop. They're now going online and uh, submissions and uh, all sorts of, uh, if you like, written materials. And so the judges, judges hearing lay litigants uh, are um, sometimes, what do we say, uh, dismayed at finding that they have to actually, um, if you like, pick apart a case that's being made, but, and I offer sometimes, as I used to do in the Master's Court, I used to say, what you should be saying to me is this, and what you should be saying to me is that, and they go away and put it in an affidavit, because that was the only way to enable uh, the parties to actually f formulate a, a coherent uh, defense. And so, some judges will, some judges will, uh, uh, if, if they have time, they, they will actually spot the potential of a, of a particular defense 
and will encourage the defendant to, to, to uh, explore that. Other judges will not, because they'll say, you got the money, didn't you? And so uh, what, where's the injustice? And there is, there's, if you like, there's several hundred years of, of, uh, of uh, moral um, um, force behind that, that if somebody got, got money, he has to pay it back. But the question is, to whom she, he should pay it back? And is, is it now statute barred, for example? That's, these, are, right. these are issues. And now I have to look at, I know you've answered a lot of questions, but what, in your view, uh, simply put, uh, not really simply, I know, how can we get to re rebalance this situation here to have a, a more level and fair playing field for, for all litigants, but especially lay litigants, but all people that are... In, in, that are whatever, in distress the mortgage for whatever reason. In the, court, in the court system? Yeah. I think we well, should have a... Banking uh, court, yeah. Yeah, we should have a system uh, which we might call a walia. <laughs> and uh, no, I'm joking again, because 250 euro isn't going to get legal advice of the sort of, uh, on the sort of topics that have been discussing here. Mm. Legal, ad legal aid is the only way for, um, for the issues which are required to be litigated by the EU to, to be brought forward. In my view, we should be trying to avoid the courts altogether. And that's why I, I would have a hope that the, uh, uh, the, um, the um, transposition of the directive, or, or even just that portion of the directive, that they would have, they would have taken, taken Professor Kenna's suggestion, which was that this was an opportunity to create a new structure, an architecture for processing and uh, um, completing uh, the, the um, resolution of credit default situations. We already have it in an insolvency situation, and it's, it's, there's creep there. I think the, uh, the um, credit purchasers are aware, are aware of the fact that they're losing, they're losing houses, domestic houses are going, gone, he's gone, that man's gone bankrupt and he's holding his house. That man's gone bankrupt, he's holding his house. So there's, there's a, an element where, if you like, a, there's a, it could be argued that there's a safe harbor now being created for family homes in the insolvency end of the, lit of the litigation, but not in the non-insolvent cases, people who actually do have money, no matter, you know, they, they're not actually bust yet, they're, they're, they're not over the top. And that's, th th those are the cases which should be uh, accommodated um, with, with equal sympathy. Right, and, and thank you for your detailed correspondence, but the previous correspondence that you sent out to all the Oroxus members, were you disappointed with the, with the response, or, or lack of response in, in, with, with that? No, no, I, I wasn't. Um, I, I, this is a public service broadcast on my part. I thought, there's an information deficit here. Nobody knows about this directive. No, nobody knows about sec Article 28 in the directive. And the, the quick, quick method of, of communicating the advantages of this new moratorium that I call is to communicate it directly to the TDs. They're entitled to know what's going on, and they're entitled to get this information at this point, not two or three years down the road when the central bank has, has sorted out what they intend to do with it. This is the point now where, the, where TDs can tell their constituents that they should go to their solicitors, and if they're not getting reasonable forbearance, they should injunct the, uh, the, the lender because they're entitled to have reasonable forbearance offered to them uh, under the EU directive. That's the new law. It's direct effect. They're entitled to an offer. I'm really, and I really appreciate that. I think most did, because we, we have all have our, our, doors be, our doors be knocked down by people just don't, don't know where to go. And, and finally, probably, um, the lack of interest of the media was another issue I, I was surprised at. But um, you took the case to yonder to, 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 to the New York. So could I be, if I allow me, Chair, to ask? How were you received? And oh. I saw someone. How did that? How did that? Um, what do you think it was all over there? I think we were a basket case, or you know, I was interested in some of your. Uh, no, no, it was it was a lawyer to lawyer meeting, and we had a number of lawyer jokes, <laughs> <That's hilarious. laughs> uh, which uh, cheer cheer us up no end. And everybody else says, "What they were? What were they talking about?" But uh, it was it was um, interesting, nevertheless. I, for example, uh, I introduced to them I introduced them to this notion of what is conclusive evidence. 
And I said, this is, you know, the, the Irish courts have said, oh, what conclusive means is conclusive. That's it, you know. Uh, but I said, no, no. I said, the very first book I took off the shelf, I said, it was this, this one here, the 1911 Irish Law Reports. Can you imagine? 1911 Law Reports. And I opened, and I found the case of Murphy versus the King. Now, this is the sort of thing lawyers really love. Say, oh, Murphy versus the King. What was that about? It was about the pension that had been granted to Mrs. Murphy. And she got it for five months, and then she died. Then they discovered that she, uh, the, 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 sorry, the pensioner was awarded on a, under the section which said that the decision of the pension officer was final and conclusive. And after her death, <laughs> the pension officer said, hang on, she wasn't 70, so she shouldn't have got the pension. So uh, uh, they, they challenged, Murphy, that's the, the, the estate, they challenged the king and said, you're not entitled to get the money back because it's final and conclusive. And the court said, ah, oh, this is ridiculous. There's no way that that means what, what, it's, uh, what you're saying to us. I'll just give you the quote. They said, Mr. O'Connor, in his able argument on behalf of the suppliant, was obliged to admit that the words final and conclusive at the end of subsection two of section seven of this, the act cannot be taken in an absolute sense. He admitted that, for instance, in case of fraud, a decision of the pension authority could be reopened. There is no allegation of fraud in the present case, and so on and so forth. So that case went to the Lord Chief Justice and all that kind of stuff. I mean, five guineas. You know, the Americans were delighted to hear this sort of thing. It's, it's, it's uh, stuff for after-dinner speeches. But the point about it is, is that it, 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 it illustrates the problem from a lay litigant's point of view. If he goes into court here in Ireland and says, oh, judge, I know that it's, uh, uh, the, 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 the loan originator's name is on the register, but that's not conclusive. And the judge will say, oh, yes, it is. The act says it is. And, you, and then the lay litigant says, well, how do I get around that? And there are ways of getting around that. If you've got a lawyer who says, that section is now ambiguous. There are two or more meanings to it. And having identified that there's an ambiguity, you then have an, an army or an array of mechanisms available to you to determine what it actually means. And one of them is, one of them is contemporanea espositio, which is, what did it mean at the time the act was passed? And you have to go back to 1891. What did conclusive mean in 1891? Now, can you imagine any lay litigant saying, uh, I'm going to hold you up now, judge, for another half a day while we discuss the um, uh, inter statutory interpretation of this section, because it's not as the courts have said. No, circuit court judge will say, there's a ruling on this. Judge Baker says it's conclusive. So you're, you're stuck with that. That has to be overturned. Or you have to amend the section, which will eliminate the problem. And, and from the point of view of the investors, do you think that they learned anything from you over about the, you know? We're very, very small fry. The Irish investment market is very small fry from, from the New York perspective. They say, what's happening in Ireland? Well, uh, let us, I'll, I'll check with our Irish lawyers and so on. So the Irish lawyers are always keen to advise them that not to worry. They, they have the back of the, of the government. Not, they don't have a problem. If there's something proposed from Brussels, we're pretty sure they say that the Irish government won't jump that way, meaning they're the ones who are drafting the response. Unfortunately, that's, that's where we're at. But I, I, but I meant, yeah, I accept that answer, but I meant from the point of view of where the, the, not certainty about land registry and the whole area there that in, in relation to the, to the debts. Uh, the, the investors, are, are investors are only concerned if their investment is at risk. And so far, uh, in, in, the financial, in, in the financial market, uh, in the capital market, you can always sell on. You know, you always, you've got an asset, it's a piece of paper, I can sell it on to somebody else, make a few bob, move into something else, oil shares or something. And uh, that's, that's the way they operate in, in America. Um, this, is there, yeah, I'm probably going on too long now, but there's a decision of the Supreme Court um, uh, in OSIS, um, OSIS SPV, uh, where uh, uh, Bernie Madoff, a, a derivative action from Bernie Madoff, was being litigated in Ireland, and uh, the, the bank was, the bank said no, they wanted to stop it. They said this was champerty. You see, it's, it, it's you can't actually litigate. Um, in a case where you didn't have any involvement in it at the outset of the transaction, that you must have had some interest in it, perhaps linked to the property at the time, uh, if you're to be allowed to litigate. Because 
in London, they hold their noses in London and they say, gosh, we couldn't encourage gambling of that sort. Now, in New York, there's no problem with cases where you can buy and sell bits of paper. That's, that's standard finance here, but uh, finance there. But here, the Supreme Court decided that, I don't know why they decided. They decided they would follow the English law and say that, that it would be beneath us to consider uh, um, such skullduggery as, as allowing people to litigate on pieces of paper which were the, the sale of the right to litigate. It's pure speculation. It's like buying a bookie's ticket. So the Irish Supreme Court said, no, no, that's not right. And actually there are, I've come across a, an article by um, um, an academic in Belfast who says it's, uh, the, the Irish Supreme Court was wrong. Can you imagine that? And <laughs> I found another, another um, uh, academic who, who graduated from Cork, who's now working in Ottawa, and he says also there's a problem with this, that that's not the way things go. So these are, if you like, risks that investors face all the time. Local, local laws having, having uh, um, impact, impacting on their right to reco recover monies. At the moment, the, the possibility that Irish law is going to bring a halt to the, the, to the um, merry-go-round for the investors is not a real risk. please. Look, it's a statement more than, than a question. I mean, we see drug dealers and criminals getting legal aid. Surely uh, that the people or families are trying to keep their, keep their homes, you know, to, 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 to provide for themselves and their, and their children. Surely they should be entitled to legal aid. Uh, the problem with, the problem with this is a problem of perception. People say, these people aren't paying their debts. Why give them more state money? So there's a, there's a political, the political risk attaching to that. I'm paying my mortgage. I don't see why my neighbour down the road should get legal aid to fight his case to get a reduction. Unfortunately, from a social point of view, we have to say that's not now something that we have to, uh, we have to um, uh, embrace because we are good European citizens and we are going to apply the new directive. So legal aid is, is right. Yeah, thank, thank you very much for all your work and, and, and wish you happy and holy and peaceful business. Thank you. Uh,